Um, I am Heather Nollis, and I'm a senior machine learning engineer at T-Mobile, and I am here to tell you about how I went from being somebody who does everything organically in Rock Harris to actually loving chatbot framework. Um, and so a little bit about me that's necessary to understand how I got here is, again, I'm Heather. I'm a, I've am been at T-Mobile since 2017, and I used to want to get my PhD in neuroscience. Um, I had a year-long project that was a study in rats where I was having to measure and take their blood pressure and collect all this data. And then it turns out that when I was done, they were like, Heather, we need you to now hand your data over to an analytics team. And I was like, I absolutely cannot let that happen. This is my precious data that I, I curated myself. Uh, so I'm just going to go out and become qualified to be the analytics team that you wanted me to hand it off to because I have a control problem. And then that's how I fell in love with, with uh, computers and programming in general is by not really wanting to give up my data. Um, and the team that I work on, we, we are called AI at T-Mobile, and our scope is primarily customer care. So that means when somebody is calling T-Mobile because they have an issue, if they are DMing with us on Twitter, if they are texting with us in the app, our goal is to use AI to make that the most seamless transaction possible in whatever capacity. And so what this means is that we have a team that is fully set for real-time AI. That's from the data people who are doing the analytics to the product people who are having ideas to the ops specialists and developers who are delivering it. My team contains every single thing that you need to take an idea to development, to deployment, to support. And before I can tell you about what I'm here to talk about today, which is pretty remarkable, uh, you have to understand where T-Mobile has been. And so on in August 2018, I just want to set the landscape for what that looked like so we can compare it to our current state. Um, so in August 18th, 2018, T-Mobile does these things called uncarrier moves where they're like big, bold industry initiatives that show how we are different than our competitors and how attunedly we are listening to our customers. And so on that day, we launched this commercial. And it went on to say how talking to robots is the worst. And at T-Mobile, we will never we will never have a robot. Don't worry. Come to T-Mobile. We don't do robots. Um, so you might think, why am I here talking to you if I, if I was at a company that just three years ago was proudly anti-robot? Um, and how could you have an AI team that is proudly anti-robot? So to set the context there is we had a project called Expert Assist. And how it works is... When somebody calls up T-Mobile and they say, I, th I think I forgot to pay my bill. Can I do that now? Um, what we want to do is use machine learning to transcribe that audio into text, classify that text so we can tell the topic that they're talking about, and then go and get our T-Mobile expert whatever information we can to help them solve the problem. So if you see at... There's like recommended responses that are listed over there. There's it says the topic is a general payment up in the right hand corner. There are account information that was pulled up. And then there are even internal Wikipedia articles that could show the expert how to solve the problem if they haven't done it themselves. So this is the land that I was living in was building products like this. And we were serving over two million insights a day to our to our experts in the call centers. Um, and we were doing this using TensorFlow. So we were building conversational neural networks that had some features of natural language and some features of the actual account facts. And we were using these handcrafted neural networks to classify the topic of these conversations and to show those, those insights to people. And then I'm here today. Uh, it's three years later, and I am here talking to you about our chatbot for almost the most unlikely person to be doing so. I was on a team that prided itself in not doing chatbots. I did all of these this hand-spun model work, and I was at a company that was incredibly, incredibly anti-bot, so much so that we had commercials running that, that said that we don't like robots. So how can you take a company from hating robots and to having somebody be able to speak at a conference about a robot project that we are very, very proud of. Um, and it starts, it starts very simply, which we, we learned quickly that some customers prefer self-service. So the assumption that we made that people don't want to talk to robots is actually false. Uh, for one third of people, whenever they have to call T-Mobile, if we would offer them a quick way to chat with an IVR system to solve their problem, one third of people would prefer to do that than to wait 60 seconds to be connected to a live expert. We also saw that in messaging, so not calling, but the people who want to contact us via Facebook, via Twitter, via our app, via text messaging, 
the people who don't want to talk to us on the phone is increasing every year. So our volume is increasing through those channels as people realize like, wait, I can answer my T-Mobile problems on Facebook. And then also people are getting more and more annoyed whenever they have to pull up the phone. They're preferring to go to Facebook. So that then it says, well, we can only truly be listening to our customers, that one third that really values a self-service experience if we are to do what we said we wouldn't three years ago and build a chat bot but you know, only for those who want it. And so we had the idea, let's make a bot. And since I was already on this team that had this beautiful, robust internal topic model, we have a model that works. Let's just throw something on top of that and deliver some sort of self-service experience to our customers. And that makes sense, right? No, it, 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 did, it doesn't make sense. And, and I'll, I'll walk through the problems with that implementation and why we decided to um, abandon our love for our homegrown models and to switch to the Raza framework. Um, and so how it worked for me, I had a team come to me and basically say, hey, I have 10 intents that I need. Can you make them quickly? They're, they're, they're super specific. And TensorFlow models, they're deep learning models, and the, the architecture for ours takes thousands and thousands of human crafted labels to create a new intent. So uh, immediately I was like, no, we don't have the data to create these new intents. And so we started to say, okay, if I, if I don't have enough data and we don't have enough time to create these new intents, can we leverage our own existing topics? And so this is kind of, we ended up with 10 intents that we were looking at and I just wanted to map out the problem space here. So we have an in-house TensorFlow topic model. It has 88 intents, it is hierarchical. There is a defined taxonomy, it already exists. They are general topics like network um, and they're they meant to run on a 10 message window to tell you really what, what has happened in the past 10 turns in a conversation. And they require about 2000 utterances every single time you wanna make a new intent. But what I was being asked for was 10 new intents some of them were overlapping, overlapping with our old taxonomy and sometimes overlapping with each other. They were highly specific. They were supposed to run on a single message and we had no date, no label data and no data labeling support. And so we found very quickly, if we tried to treat our topics as intense, we risk showing nonsense responses to customers. So one of our topics was general payment, but the intent that the, that the bot team wanted was pay my bill. But there are so many things that could be classified as general payment that are definitely not pay my bill. For instance, I won't pay my bill because I don't understand it. I'm just checking to see if my payment has gone through and I want to change my payment method. So if we were to say when general payment is detected, send them a link to pay their bill and give them that bot experience, we aren't selecting for the right people. We're showing if I want to change my payment method and we come back with great, you can pay your bill right here. It's a horrible, horrible customer experience. And then, there came the nuance between all the little things that the bot team wanted to do in their experience. So specifically, I pulled out three of the intents that I was asked for were shop for a device. I want to add a line and get a new device for that new line. And I want to add a line and I'm bringing my old phone. And they wanted me to do this with natural language. And so I pulled out some sample utterances that obviously are munched. Um, so you can't see any customer data, but you can see very quickly how the natural language for all three of these situations is very similar. Buy a cool phone for my sister's line versus buy a cool phone for my sister and add a line for her to my account versus I want to add my sister, but she already has a cool phone. It was it was incredibly painful looking at this and trying to think to myself how I would be able to do this using natural language in our giant topic model that already has 88 other intents. So we had the idea of trying Raza. And that was because Raza, I understand the machine learning that's underneath it. As a machine learning engineer, it's open source and I can check their code. It uses the frameworks that I'm familiar with, so TensorFlow. It requires less training data than our current model. I, and I was promised that I would get to reuse all my very fun favorite machine learning bits. Like we have some beautiful embeddings that we've created. And they're like, well, in Raza, you can just reuse those. Um, and then if we wanted to go down this bot path, we should probably be investing in a bot framework. I don't want to create one from scratch. Um, the issue was that we couldn't get stakeholder buy-in to spend time doing this. So uh, me and a data scientist on my team, Peter, we spent four hours one day and just said, what if we spend, instead of saying it'll take four months to get you these 10 intents back using our in-house and beautiful topic model, what if we spend four hours and plug it into Raza and see what we come up with? Um, and these are the actual results of that four hour experiment. Um, 
So many things have changed since then. And as you see, there's not a ton of data in there, but, but with only four hours of work, we were already to show, hey, there's incredible value in creating specific intents to the things that you want to show. And I don't think that standing up Raza would be double work. And so that was enough to sell them. And they said, yes, you're right. We should be using Raza. I had no idea that we could move this fast. This is something that for our in-house topic model would have taken so incredibly long and you can do it very quickly here. I, I, I give you the thumbs up, we will invest in Raza. And that's how this talk actually got started was it was a talk that I made for my care stakeholders to try and get their buy-in based on this, this experiment. And so then there's the question, I've spent a lot of time on a beautiful handcrafted machine learning team, and now I've spent some time on my Raza team. And what what's different when we decided to use Raza? And so again, just to remind you that our model would run on a window of messages. There's 2000 utterances minimum for an intent, and it has about 80% accuracy. And that was the world we knew. The Raza models are slightly different because they run on a single message, they're faster, and our out of the box accuracy was slightly higher. But that's not the remarkable part. Um, the pace is what is absolutely astonishing to me. So with our TensorFlow model that we had in market, um, it was in market for two years. And the team that supports it had done literally hundreds, if not thousands of production releases. And only a handful of those included model updates. And in that amount of time, we were only able to add and validate two intents. But then you look at our Raza, NLU model, and it has spent five months in market. We have had 43 production releases, 19 of those have included the model, and we have added, since our initial launch, 28 intents. And that's incredible. That's that speed that I never thought was possible, especially creating natural language classifiers. And so how are we able to move that quickly? What about Raza does it for us? And so for me, the number one thing is visibility. When using Raza X, visibility into the actions that my model is taking comes out of the box. So as soon as I release a new model, I can be in there actively reviewing every single prediction it's making and making sure that it it's working in real time. And it's in a beautiful GUI that's not diving through Splunk logs and going into S3 buckets and having to use PySpark to pull out confidence intervals. Um, and it allows our stakeholders to do this very same thing. So my partners on the care side of the house can open the same link as me and review conversations conversations. And then they can suggest fixes to me without knowing how to use GitHub at all. And it goes directly into my Git repo. So that alone, being able to show stakeholders, hey, this is this is working. It's building. You can see it. You can touch it and you can correct it has been the most powerful thing for me because the, the hardest thing to build in machine learning is trust in your models. And the only way you can do that is by shining light on it. And I didn't have to do any extra work. So for expert assist, our model still doesn't have this type of interface. If I went to pull these metrics, it can take me over a day to do the PySpark query to get to get everything that I could see in Raza X absolutely immediately without any work on my end. And then, of course, the, the burden of this initial data set is lessened. We don't have to have a data curation team to actually stand up intents. We can we can create small intents on the fly, watch how they perform in production and add real data from our production logs to create those intents. So my favorite here is we have an experience where we are helping people pay a bill and when they when we offered them the link to pay their bill, sometimes systems that we integrate with go down. And with, there was a period of time where the payments link that we were sending was down and people were saying, hey, this doesn't work for me. And so I created an intent that's just broken that lets us know when our customers are telling us something's broken. And now we can use that intent and how often it's fired to actually inform the team that creates the payments link when their thing is broken before they know, because our customers will tell us faster than systems can detect it. And that was something that we created on the fly in Raza X while actively reviewing conversations with my product stakeholders. And then there's a lot of reporting that's available out of the box that helps drive these incremental improvements. If I wanted to know um, the like per intent metrics for my in-house topic model, it takes a labeling team to give me a validation data set to find that. But Raza has some very quick cross validation options and that really helps us target these incremental improvements, which I have never been able to actually be agile with my data science before. Um, and that's what this slide is kind of about, where I finally feel like we figured out how to make data science and machine learning agile by leveraging Raza. And we do that by we have this user experience tiger team that runs parallel scrums to our software team. So our software team is out there. They are building beautiful action server integrations 
but we have a separate team that is our product owner, our conversation designer, the data scientist and machine learning engineers, and then bot tuners who are uh, junior people who research the intents, they implement our weekly upgrades to models. Um, and we have those people solely focused on a completely separate Scrum that pushes these updates faster because traditional software grooming can take three or four weeks for a story to get out. But sometimes we see an issue happening in production immediately and we're, we're just able to iterate faster using the Raza framework than our traditional software stack is. So we need a separate Scrum. Um, and we also have a rotational software engineer who comes and sits on that team. So yeah, as you can understand, if you're if you're a Java developer and you're on a chatbot project and you never get to touch the model, that probably doesn't feel good. And so this allows for cross training on those Raza models. So that way, all of our engineers can understand the core components that they're working with. And and it's no longer a data scientist on a little island all alone. Um, it creates really tight cohesion because we like to do a lot of fun personal bot responses that require a lot of API integration. And so by having these rotational engineers on our team, understanding what's coming in the pipeline and being able to focus on that, we're able to just move very, very quickly. And so, so what's the impact? How does T-Mobile feel now? And I try to think of ways to summarize it and I think that there's there's one number that I really can't get over, which is customer assist. We, we call the bot Cassie. So Cassie on her own took three point four million dollars of care contact since we launched her in July. Um, and to me, that's incredible. That's three point four million dollars of, of, of care contacts that she's been able to handle all by herself. Um, we have also sold a few more chatbot projects throughout our organization. So we have some stuff coming up with marketing, some stuff with support, because as an organization, T-Mobile is really valuing these chatbots. And we actually have multiple chatbot teams now. So we had a team from Legacy Sprint that came over and now they are working for the HR team, building HR chatbots. Um, so truly, T-Mobile has gone from a company that said absolutely zero bots a few years ago with a few key projects to a, t a company that's just absolutely embracing chatbots and trying to bring them in as much as possible. And then there's my very favorite part, which is data scientists throughout T-Mobile are beginning to leverage Raza models to lessen the burden of labeling data manually. So a story here is we wanted to know the impact that iPhone launches were having on our care conversations. And so a team came to me and they said, Heather, can we use your topic model to do this? And my heart broke because, as you know, my topic model is very general and they want something very specific. People buying iPhones right now. Um, and so instead of saying, here's how I can shoehorn you into the topic model and here's how we can subset data and fit your use case. Instead, I was able to say, actually, Give me one hour of your time. I'm going to teach you how to build your own intents in Raza, how to rip out the models, and then I have some Python multi-threaded code that will allow you to classify your own stuff so you can stop bothering me. So it's literally like the I've gotten to move from the teach a man or give a man a fish model of munching data for people before to the teach a man to fish model of teaching people how to get smart about classifying their own data in a way that's incredibly accessible to analyst level people throughout our and so that's that's the very shortest story that I could tell of how we went to from being incredibly anti chatbot and me personally not wanting to ever work on a chatbot to being just fully behind this entire framework. Uh, and I do want to give a, a special thanks to Team Kit and SMPD because I'm only here because of the great work that like the 20 people I work with do. Um, I just really want to acknowledge that.